Thank God willing, Dennis will have the devotional. Thank you, John, for your message, and Todd for directing our thoughts in prayer tonight. We are concluding Daniel chapter 2 this evening, and uh, we'll be entering an examination of chapter 3 as the evening progresses. So open your Bibles to the second chapter. Daniel has revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar his dream and its meaning. Now in verse 46, the king responds to Daniel's efforts. And remember, Daniel has assured the king that it was not through his abilities, but through the power of God that he was able to make known the dream and its meaning. Now in verse 46 and following, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained in the king's court. That's how chapter 2 closes. Just some real quick highlights now. Nebuchadnezzar pays homage to Daniel, but please do not infer from that that he worshipped Daniel. Paying homage and worship are generally uh, synonymous, but he is honoring God by honoring God's servant, Daniel. I can assure you, knowing what we already have learned about Daniel, that he would not permit the king to worship him. So when we read this text, we understand that in honoring Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's goal is to honor Daniel's God, whom he now refers to as essentially the God of gods and the Lord of kings. You will come across language similar to that in the New Testament in relationship to God the Father, Christ the Son, and in particular in relationship to Jesus, he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And this is a similar kind of concept that is expressed here. And why has uh, Nebuchadnezzar concluded this? Because Daniel's God is a revealer of mysteries. Mysteries are things that are unknown, but then are revealed. Daniel has revealed by the assistance of God, what could be accomplished through no other means, the king's dream and its meaning. And if you recall, in the early sections of chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar demanded of his soothsayers, astrologers, magicians, and Chaldeans that they tell him what he dreamed and then what it meant, one of their responses was, we can't do this because this is something that only the gods can do. Well, they claim to have a direct line to the gods, but obviously those claims were false. Daniel, on the other hand, was the servant of the one true God, and as a result did have means and method to satisfy the king's request that no one else had access to because no one else in terms of their relationship to the king who has been called upon has this kind of relationship. The king had promised to reward the one who could fulfill his request. So the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts. And interestingly, my curiosity is such that I would want to know, I wonder what kinds of gifts did Daniel received. Today, it might be the title to a new car, maybe the deed to a new home, uh, expensive jewelry. Well, 
the jewelry is a possibility, but those other items, I'm not certain that he could have gotten a title to a new car, given the fact that they're relatively new advancement in technology. But I'm just curious about what he received, and yet there is no record at all, which reminds me that this book is unique among books because it gives us the information we need, not necessarily what we desire, and does it with brevity and clarity. He had made a promise. Daniel had met the terms of that promise. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar honored his word and rewarded him. You see something similar to this in the story of Joseph and Pharaoh. You see something akin to this in the story of Haman and Mordecai in the book of Esther. Mordecai had actually learned of a plot against the king and informed uh, the king's men and those who were leading the plot were obviously taken out and nothing had been done. And when the king one night couldn't sleep, he was reading the annals of uh, his role as king and discovered that this had happened and Mordecai hadn't been rewarded. So he said to Haman, what should you do to a man that the king wishes to honor? And Haman thought he was speaking of himself and so he gave this list of things that he would really like and in turn the king said, honor Mordecai in this fashion. So the kind of thing that Nebuchadnezzar did is not unique in ancient history. And as much as we might look at Nebuchadnezzar and say he was a hard man, uh, temperamental, uh, sometimes uh, terribly harsh, he was also a man of his word. And he did exactly what he said he would do. Many gifts made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Babylon was divided into several provinces, but the central province was the province of Babylon where the city of Babylon existed. So Daniel is rewarded with what would have been the best post in the kingdom, so to speak. He couldn't have received a much higher honor than the one that had been bestowed upon him. He's made chief of uh, the prefects, uh, that is, he's in charge of all of the main men in this administration. And believe it or not, the Babylonian government was highly organized. And you'll see that when we look at chapter 3. And at the top of this list, obviously under the king, Daniel finds a very significant role. And what also is, I think, worthy of note is that given this uh, lofty position, he doesn't forget his friends. His friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because of the story that follows, and it is written in Aramaic. Remember that beginning in the middle of chapter 2, verse 4, through the close of chapter 7, the text is not Hebrew, but Aramaic, and therefore, uh, these boys that are so prominent in chapter 3 are noted by their Aramaic or Babylonian name rather than their Hebrew name. But Daniel said to the king, uh, let's appoint these three boys over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Uh, but Daniel remained in the king's court. So they're given positions of authority out in the, the nation of Babylon, but Daniel is close to home where he can continue to be, no doubt at this time, the king's trusted advisor. Now, what is the significance of chapter 2 before we go to chapter 3? It is here that we discover God's plan, a plan that was in the mind of God, if you read Ephesians chapter 3, before the beginning. And you may ask, how is that possible? It is possible because God knows the future the way we may remember the past. And he knows and therefore can plan for what lies ahead. 
even before the events in Eden in chapter 3, he really knew that man would fall, that sin would enter the world, and there needed to be some remedy for man's transgression. He would come in the person of his only begotten son in the establishment of his kingdom, church, or body, which is God's spiritual family. And in Daniel 2, 44, we are told specifically when that event, God's Son entering the world to be the Savior of man and to establish his universal kingdom would occur. And you cannot be honest with the scriptures without drawing the conclusion that this specific account of history is absolutely in every detail on target and you cannot explain it without divine assistance. So when I read Daniel, my faith is reaffirmed not just in the existence of God, but in his sovereignty, his rule of the universe and the realization that his plans will be completed no matter what. You remember what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16 when Peter had just confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of God? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and I will give to you the keys to the kingdom. And the gates of hell, or Hades, can't prevent this from occurring. Not even death would prevent Jesus from doing what was in the mind of God before the beginning, and what is laid out specifically in Daniel chapter 2. So acknowledge the role of God in the events in the second chapter, Acknowledge that only God knows the end from the beginning and recognize, therefore, that he is real. Our faith in him is not misplaced and there is solid evidence, reasonable and logical arguments that we can give to doubters that if understood and accepted will instill faith in the heart. And I might just one more time remind you of John chapter 5 beginning in verse 30 and reading through verse 39 Jesus offered five unassailable proofs of his divinity and the fifth was in verse 39 you search the scriptures for in them you think you have everlasting life and they are they which testify me and Daniel 2 is an excellent example one of many of the truthfulness of that statement that leads us now to chapter 3. I don't intend, God willing, to spend as much time in the third chapter as we did in the second. The third chapter is primarily designed to tell us that faith in God is not misplaced. And we must have faith and trust Him regardless of the consequences that we may be called upon to face. We do not know what, how God may react in any given situation, but we know how he can react, that he is not limited as man is limited, and therefore we must always trust in him. Chapter 3 begins in verse 1 with this statement. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, 90 feet, and its breadth 6 cubits, 9 feet. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The exact location of this specific plain is unknown today. But what we do know is that this was an extremely large monument. The largest similar monument was over a hundred feet tall. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 
And so what we're reading here is not in any way out of the realm of man's capability uh, in the uh, 6th century B.C. I have no idea how this image actually uh, was created or what form it really took. I can only cite for you tonight the dimensions that Daniel gives here in chapter 3, verse 1. I've seen other renditions where the figure is seated on a throne, and I can't tell you that the specific image stood, was seated, or anything about it other than it was golden. And that may be reminiscent of what Daniel revealed to Nebuchadnezzar relative to his dream. He saw a similar figure, I think, and the head was gold and it represented Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom. Why do you suppose Nebuchadnezzar has commissioned the building of this particular image? I really don't have an answer for you. I can offer you some surmises. Perhaps he thought to himself, I don't want to be just the head of gold. I want to be the head and the foot. I want everything in between to be of gold. Perhaps if that happens, then that stone carved out of the mountain without human hands will not be able to strike the feet that are iron and clay and topple the entire figure and essentially render it dust. Maybe he's concerned about, at this point, the impact that all of these Jews that he's brought from Jerusalem and trained and now serve in Babylon may be having too much influence. So let's just make another God and call everybody in leadership out here to Dura and let them all, when the music plays, bow before it and uh, acknowledge and worship the God that I've created. I just don't know, and there's nothing in the record that gives us any indication as to what really was back of Nebuchadnezzar's thinking in regard to this. But it's very clear he's built something that's pretty impressive and he's brought nearly everyone in a position of authority in Babylon, and this is a really large empire. It occupies a lot of territory, involves lots of people who speak different languages, and he's brought all of those in leadership roles here to bow before his image. He is king, and his decree is when the orchestra plays, you bow. And if you don't, you will suffer the consequences. It's very similar to his demand that his dream be revealed and then interpreted. If you don't, you'll be torn from limb to limb and your homes will be destroyed and your families as well. Well, it's much the same thing here. He's king, a monarch with absolute power. What he says goes. So do you think anybody in a position of leadership in Babylon will disobey the king? Not if they want to keep their position and their head and their home. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather, to gather the satraps. There's a word we don't use a whole lot, do we? I haven't worked it into a conversation in ever. It's simply a term that describes high officials in the Babylonian government that ruled over extensive pieces of geography. They, they would be, I, I guess we would say, the equivalent maybe uh, with, in the framework of our own government of, of governors. We have a president and central government in Washington, but then we have 50 states, and each state has a governor. Uh, there has to be some kind of organization for uh, government to function, and Babylon was a highly effective government 
And it seems that this is the way that it was organized. Now, I realize that in the text there's a reference to governors, but I wouldn't suggest to you that they are on a par with the governors that we're familiar with today. This, this is just a hierarchy, a structure or organization designed to make government flow smoothly. You start at the top and you work your way down. It goes from, from satraps to prefects to governors to counselors to treasurers, uh, the justices, uh, the magistrates, and then all of the officials of the provinces. Everybody else who has some kind of, some kind of leadership role from the loftiest to the lowliest, come to Dura to bow before the image. It was a dedication service, if you please. They've come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. It's an image of gold, we know that, but I don't believe there's anything that would suggest that it was solid gold. In fact, some historians would argue that there would not have been enough gold in Babylon to have created something like this that was, in fact, solid gold. But what typically was done, and you see this even in relationship to the building of the tabernacle and later the temple, is that things are gold-plated. And so I don't know what this image was actually made of. In all probability... It was made of brick, clay brick. Uh, Babylon is not an area that afforded large quarries and, and stone. And so most of what archaeologists have uncovered uh, in their research and in their digs in this part of the world clearly indicates that brick was the, the major building product. It's very possible that it was built out of brick, made there at Dura, and then it would have been plated with gold. It would still have been a very impressive kind of thing. And once it is completed, there must be a dedication. Until there is a dedication, it really does not have any great significance. But once it is dedicated, then it takes on an entirely different meaning and people's attitudes toward it uh, will be altered as a result. So all of these high muckety mucks, I'm not going to bother to read their names again, they all gathered for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, verse 3, and they stood before that image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So they all gathered around, it's on a plane, that's a a level area, so it would afford the opportunity for masses of people to come and act, actually encircle this image, and that would get most everyone uh, easily within uh, a reasonable distance that they could see and hear what was going on. The herald then proclaimed aloud. The herald would be uh, the man who is in charge of getting the people's attention and directing them as to the proper uh, course of action required by the king. He speaks for the king, and his words are recorded by Daniel. You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. Remember, everybody from the entire empire in positions of authority have assembled here. They're different nations, they're different languages, and therefore it's necessary to communicate to all of them the wishes of the king. I don't believe that there's any reason for us to draw the conclusion that there was just one man speaking to everybody. There would no doubt have been need for some interpreters, though they're not mentioned, and everyone needs to hear needs to understand, and therefore needs to comply. And the demand is very simple. It was that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image 
that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Now, I did a lot of reading this week in preparation for tonight's class, and I couldn't find a single source that would agree on the specific instruments that are actually involved here. At least three of them have Greek names, and their precise meaning is not known. What I would just say to you is that there were wind, uh, there were percussion, and there were stringed instruments, as well as other instruments that are not mentioned here. And apparently this is a rather large assembly of musicians who are brought to this place for this occasion to play as a signal for those present to bow before the image and worship. And typically, to bow before an image like this would require that one get on his knees and actually bend till his head touches the ground. You may see something similar to this uh, if you ever notice Muslims at their hours of prayer, getting out their prayer rugs, getting on their knees and, and, and praying. They generally bow uh, sometimes a number of times touching uh, the floor with their heads as a sign of reverence and subjection. Uh, that goes way back in history and would have been the kind of thing that everyone was compelled to do. When I read this, I don't typically bother to reread the list of uh, those present, nor the instruments that will be played. I just look at it and say, when the orchestra plays, everybody bows because that's the essence of what they're told. And then, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Well, my first question is, what in the world do they have need of a fiery furnace out here on dedication day? But then again, remember what I told you about the construction? It was probably brick and brick come out of the furnace. They, they just don't carve out chunks of clay. They have to be fired to have uh, strength and durability. So a furnace would be necessary. The exact kind of furnace is not stated. And I can't show you a picture of one from ancient history. But believe it or not, there are representations of them on what are called base reliefs. These are pictures carved on the faces of stone. And the best way to actually describe some of those that have been uh, discovered is to say that they look in appearance much like those old-fashioned milk jugs. You remember the milk jugs that uh, people would get their milk in when it was delivered at homes. I, I never had that experience growing up in the country. Our milk came a different way, but uh, many of you may recall that time. And the furnace had that kind of shape. There was a top, large opening, obviously where the smoke uh, would uh, rise and uh, exit, and also where material would be thrown in, the ore that is to be smelted. There would be at the base uh, an opening where the wood and the charcoal could be inserted uh, to provide the heat. There would be small holes around the structure where bellows could be attached to create greater heat. Uh, scientists have actually recreated these uh, very furnaces and uh, they say that they could produce heat uh, up to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So they would work really well. And you could toss men in from the top. You could see them in the base of the furnace where there is this opening and, and the wood and charcoal and other materials are, are tossed in. So if you can picture that, God bless you. I have trouble picturing it, but that's the best I can do if you're asking what kind of furnace was the answer that the archaeologists give. And uh, it was going to be heated seven times hotter 
than customary. And that's just an idiomatic expression that says make it as hot as you can. It comes because, believe it or not, out of everyone who was assembled here on the plane when the orchestra played, there were three men who did not do as the king commanded. Do you ever think about what you would do in certain situations? I do. And I know what I ought to do, but I cannot honestly tell you that I would do it. You almost have to be in that situation to actually know what you're made of and how you would respond. I know what I should do, but I'm not going to be so bold as to tell you that I know that I would do it. But there were three boys here. They're actually young men by now because the estimate is that this event occurred between perhaps 14 and 18 years after the events in Chapter 2. And I suggested to you that the events in Chapter 2 came shortly after their education was completed. They would have been 17 or 18 at the time that Daniel interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, they're, they're young men now uh, here on the plain of Dura. You want to know where Daniel is at this point? I don't have a clue, and neither does anyone else. Therefore, as soon as the people heard the sound of the, the orchestra and every kind of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So you just envision, if you can, this image, uh, this blaring orchestra, and then everybody is on their knees with their head pressed against the ground, except for three. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans, some translations say astrologers, and I told you uh, when we were dealing with chapter 2 that this word Chaldean is used in two different ways. It represents one of the groups of advisors that the king relied upon, you, you magicians, soothsayers, astrologers, and Chaldeans. But the term can also simply mean anyone uh, who is a citizen of Babylon. And some translators believe that these are just representatives of the Babylonian government, and others say, no, they were actually men in positions very much like the one Daniel had and were, in fact, overseen by Daniel, who were jealous that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were promoted as they were, and they're looking for any and every way to get at them. And... Uh, they don't just want them demoted, they want them destroyed. And what's true in chapter 3, you will learn, is also true relative to Daniel in chapter 6. So they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Now, this is a fairly common kind of statement when one approaches a, a monarch uh, to wish him or even her a long life. You, O king, have made a decree. I'm pretty sure he already knew that he had done this, but they're going to dot all their I's and cross all their T's. You made a decree that every man who hears the sound when the orchestra plays uh, is to fall down and worship the golden image. Yeah, I, I did that, Nebuchadnezzar would acknowledge. And furthermore, whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. There are lots of ways to die. This is one of the worst in my judgment. Of course, another option, which was mentioned in chapter 2, was to be pulled limb from limb. That's a pretty gruesome way to go, too. Neither compares with crucifixion, but it's not good. So, king... There are certain men, certain Jews, whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, these are their, their Babylonian names. One of the things that they did when they uprooted these boys from Judah and Jerusalem and resettled them in Babylon was to give them Babylonian names. And since this is a Babylonian story written in the language of Babylon, which is Aramaic, they are noted by their Babylonian names here. The Hebrew names, again, are, are uh, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah. But nobody remembers the Hebrew names. We always remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And they're absolutely right. They know what has been demanded of them. There's not a question of their misunderstanding. They know. But they cannot comply and be faithful to God. God feels so strongly about this issue that he wrote it in stone. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. You cannot worship any other deity. Judaism is unique because Judaism acknowledges one supreme, almighty, all-powerful, ever-present, eternal creator God. The rest of the world, you can have as many gods as you desire, and there's always room for one more. But if you're a faithful Jew, that simply is not possible. And these young men knew that. So what do they do? Do they compromise? Well, it's only one time and it'll be one and done and nobody will be the wiser. No. You know the story. They're not going to compromise. They cannot be faithful to God and do what the king demands. And the principle that we all know and understand and have on at least two occasions on our Sunday morning studies in Acts observed is very simple. When you have to choose between God and man, always choose God. And that choice is going to be before us more and more as time continues. Are we going to remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and do what's right or what's easy? Are we going to be willing to stand alone and for God or side with everybody and against God? I'm not telling you there's a fiery furnace in your decision. There's something far worse fires of eternal torment. And it's an extremely relevant story whose message uh, we need to, to understand. We'll quit with verse 12 tonight. And